This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Procedural sedation, the use of sedative and analgesic agents to relieve pain and anxiety and to control motor activity in patients undergoing diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, has become the standard of care for children and is widely practiced worldwide by a diverse group of specialists in both inpatient and outpatient settings. This video shows the technique of procedural sedation in children, reviewing indications, patient assessment, the use of sedative and analgesic drugs, potential adverse events, recovery, and discharge. Typical indications for procedural sedation include diagnostic imaging, fracture reduction or dislocation, wound care and repair of a laceration, incision and drainage of an abscess, lumbar puncture, bone marrow aspiration and biopsy, placement of a central venous catheter, and gastrointestinal endoscopy. Sedation will at times be contraindicated or inadvisable when the risk for adverse events is high. Carefully evaluate each patient to assess his or her suitability for sedation. Perform a directed history and physical examination to identify factors that may be relative or absolute contraindications to sedation, such as obesity, sleep apnea, allergies to medications, previous problems with sedation or anesthesia, the presence of a difficult or potentially difficult airway, and an active respiratory infection or respiratory disease. Risk assessment should include a general assessment of underlying health such as the five-point physical status classification system of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Procedural sedation is often performed only in patients who have been categorized as class one, a normal healthy patient, or class two, a patient with mild systemic disease, except in urgent or special situations. Assess and document the time at which the patient last ate or drank. For elective procedures, follow established fasting guidelines such as those of the American Academy of Pediatrics. For urgent or emergency procedures, a risk-benefit assessment should be performed. If during assessment you identify a child who is at high risk for adverse events during sedation, postpone the sedation if possible, or consult an anesthesiologist. After completing the pre-sedation assessment, discuss the risks, benefits, limitations of, and alternatives to procedural sedation with the parent or guardian and the patient if capable and obtain appropriate consent or assent. Before the procedure, children may be distressed or in pain. Age-specific psychological techniques can help children control their anxiety. Many procedures can be performed without sedation or with minimal sedation if the child can cooperate. In selected circumstances, pre-medication may be warranted. For distress, oral or intranasal midazolam is a common choice, and for pain, oral oxycodone or intranasal fentanyl. The use of a topical anesthetic to minimize procedural sensations is an essential component of procedural sedation in children and is useful before intravenous catheter placement, lumbar puncture, and laceration repair. To ensure patient safety, perform sedation only when you have the necessary age-appropriate rescue equipment including a bag mask, oxygen, and a suction device. Clinicians must have the requisite skills to effectively manage potentially adverse events, such as respiratory depression or upper airway obstruction. Either you or an immediately available colleague must be able to perform airway alignment maneuvers as well as to deliver positive pressure ventilation with a bag mask effectively and to initiate other rescue measures should any become necessary. Resuscitation equipment and medications, including reversal agents, must be immediately available. Intravenous access is often unnecessary when the route of sedation is oral, intranasal, rectal, intramuscular, or inhalational. However, you must be able to establish intravenous access, which is strongly preferred when sedation is deep or prolonged. There are three phases of procedural sedation, pre-sedation, sedation, and post-sedation. Sedation is best conceptualized as a continuum of progressive stages, ranging from lighter to deeper sedation, and finally to general anesthesia. All sedating agents except ketamine follow the sedation continuum. At the lightest end of the continuum is minimal sedation, a drug-induced state during which patients respond normally to verbal commands. 
Although patients at this level of sedation may show evidence of drowsiness and impaired coordination, normal ventilation is maintained. Minimal sedation may be adequate to allow brief minor procedures to be performed or to inhibit movement to the extent required to perform diagnostic imaging. Minimal sedation may be achieved with oral or intranasal midazolam. The next level is moderate sedation, during which patients respond purposefully to verbal commands alone or when the commands are accompanied by light tactile stimulation. At this level, cooperative children can usually be expected to open their eyes or take a deep breath on command. It is expected that patients will maintain a patent airway and adequate respirations. Moderate sedation is sufficient for motion control during diagnostic imaging and for many painful procedures in which local or topical anesthetic agents can be used, for example, laceration repair. Moderate sedation may be achieved with nitrous oxide or intravenous fentanyl and midazolam. The third level is deep sedation, in which patients cannot be easily aroused but can respond purposefully after repeated or painful stimulation. Children sedated to this level may not always maintain a patent airway and adequate respirations, so they must be monitored closely. Deep sedation is often used for painful procedures not amenable to effective local or topical anesthetic agents, for example, fracture reduction or bone marrow aspiration. Deep sedation may also be indicated if complete motion control is essential during diagnostic imaging. Deep sedation may be achieved with intravenous pentobarbital, etomidate, fentanyl and midazolam, propofol, or propofol in combination with fentanyl or ketamine. When the bounds of deep sedation are exceeded, the patient has reached the state of general anesthesia and is unresponsive to painful stimulation and is at high risk for airway obstruction and apnea. In such circumstances, immediate rescue measures may be indicated to support airway patency and ventilatory function until the patient returns to a lighter level of sedation. Patients will often move up and down the continuum during the course of a procedure. It is therefore critical to monitor patients continuously and to be prepared to rescue them from levels of sedation that are deeper than intended. Dissociative sedation with ketamine does not fit into the continuum described in this video. In dissociative sedation, Patients enter a cataleptic state in which there is functional dissociation of the higher cortical centers from outside stimuli, instead of undergoing central nervous system depression, which is a typical response to other sedating agents. The patient is typically unresponsive to pain, but spontaneous respiration and protective airway reflexes are usually maintained. Dissociative sedation may be achieved with intravenous or intramuscular ketamine. The monitoring of vital signs, including pulse oximetry, electrocardiography, and blood pressure measurement is an essential part of procedural sedation and enhances safety. Continuous pulse oximetry is mandatory for the detection of hypoxemia. Capnography is recommended, especially during deep sedation, because it provides the earliest possible advance warning of respiratory depression, apnea, and airway obstruction. Vital signs should be measured as indicated on an individual basis including at baseline, after drug administration, on completion of the procedure, during early recovery, and at completion of recovery prior to discharge. During deep sedation, vital signs are often recorded every five minutes. Patients are at highest risk for ventilatory depression shortly after the administration of intravenous medications and when procedural stimuli are discontinued. Safe sedation requires a minimum of two experienced practitioners. Typically, a physician to perform the procedure and a nurse to continuously monitor the patient and document in the electronic medical record. Depending on the anticipated level of sedation and practice setting, two physicians may be preferred, one to administer medications and to monitor the patient, and the other to perform the procedure. Sedation is frequently performed either with or without the addition of supplemental oxygen. Administering supplemental oxygen before and during deep sedation has been shown to reduce the frequency of hypoxemia. However, such administration renders pulse oximetry ineffective as an early warning device for respiratory depression. Thus, the use of capnography is strongly recommended if supplemental oxygen is used since capnographic readings are not affected by the presence or absence of additional oxygen. The drugs used in procedural sedation fall into five general classes, opioids for analgesia, sedatives for anxiety reduction and sedation, the dissociative agent ketamine for analgesia and sedation, inhalational gases for mild analgesia and sedation, 
an opioid and benzodiazepine antagonist to reverse these agents when necessary. Various agents can be administered through multiple routes, oral, intranasal, rectal, intramuscular, intravenous, and inhalational. Sedative drug choices will vary by indication. Some regimens are well suited for procedures that are not painful such as diagnostic imaging in which the primary intent is motion control. Some are for minimally painful procedures that require varying levels of motion control such as minor laceration repair. And some are for painful procedures such as fracture reduction and bone marrow aspiration. To administer medications for sedation safely and effectively, knowledge of their time of onset, peak effect, and duration of effect enhances safe administration without overlapping of peak effects. Many procedures will require repeat dosing to achieve and maintain the chosen sedation endpoint, particularly when agents used are short-acting, such as propofol. After the procedure is completed, the patient should be monitored until he or she returns to the age-appropriate baseline state and meets local criteria for safe discharge. The child should be alert, have stable vital signs, and be able to talk and sit unaided as appropriate for his or her age. However, the child does not need to be able to walk unaided before discharge or to be able to drink fluids. Fluid intake may induce vomiting if allowed too early, prolonging the recovery period. Standardized recovery scoring systems are widely used to objectively determine a safe time for discharge. Recovery time varies with the drugs used, but most patients can be discharged within one to two hours. Discharge instructions providing information about the appropriate diet, medications, activity level, and who to call for questions or problems for the 24 hours after sedation should be given to the caregiver. Pediatric procedural sedation involves a multidisciplinary approach for managing procedural anxiety and pain. It is effective and generally safe when performed by appropriately trained practitioners. The ultimate goal is to provide a painless, non-traumatic experience to children who are undergoing diagnostic and therapeutic procedures.